This is how fast your world is about to change. Here's a graph illustrating the relative standing of the world's historical great powers. You can see the United States. The de facto world power is on the way down. America is falling. America is losing its power and standing in the world. America's broke. At the same time, China is rapidly on the way up. An increasingly dominant China. A global economic powerhouse. Newfound confidence and vigour as a new global power. You look at that and you assume that it's inevitable that China is going to overtake America very soon. But what does that actually mean in terms of its impact on your life and on my life and the world as we experience it? In this video, we look at why great powers rise and decline in history and whether that's actually happening right now. We ask what difference will it make to your actual life. We'll look at possible spoilers, things happening today that have never happened before in history and ask if they make a difference. And finally, what key change might we want to make with how we see our own lives in the light of what's coming. It's quite a ride. Let's get started. Before we can ask if history will repeat itself, we need to know something about why it has been repeating itself. Let's take a quick look at the life cycle of one of the former empires. In this case, we'll take the Dutch Republic, a small country that became a world power. It became independent from the fading Habsburg Empire in 1581. At that stage, it already had a promising base of trade with the rest of the world and a unity of purpose amongst the various provinces, at least to kick out the Spanish. After independence, Dutch values and culture were more able to shape its society, and these emphasised education, saving, reward for merit, tolerance of religion and a free thought. Artistically, it thrived. Painters such as Rembrandt and Vermeer, scientists such as Hugo Grotius, Christian Huygens, the period became known as the Dutch Golden Age. Its literacy rate reached twice the world average. At its peak, the Dutch Empire contributed a quarter of the world's inventions, some of which turned out to be pivotal transformational inventions the Dutch invented ships that could go round the world to trade. They invented capitalism that could finance those foreign ventures along with the world's first mega corporation in the Dutch East India Company. And that created huge wealth via the spice trade. And they created an innovative banking system whose currency, the Dutch Gilder, became the world's first reserve currency. The Dutch became rich. Relatively speaking, at least, income per capita was more than twice that achieved by other European powers. But do you know what happens after you become rich? Well, you kind of start to lose that competitive edge. The emphasis on education and innovation began to weaken and was overtaken by others, particularly the British, who were focused then on the Industrial Revolution. Debt was part of the engine that fueled the economic growth. But as the rate of return started to go down, the quantity of debt became something of a drag. So the Bank of Amsterdam printed money to pay for everything. Now this wasn't exactly paper money as we know it today. It only existed as ledger entries in the Bank of Amsterdam. The bank particularly lent this money to the Dutch East India Company, which, because of the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War disrupting its activity, was not able to repay those debts. The bank's credibility failed and it had nothing left. One day there's a new empire in town and a new world order. As the Dutch originally did to the Habsburgs, so did the British to the Dutch and of course, ultimately, the Americans to the British. All the repeating elements are present in that story. They were famously identified by one highly successful investor, Ray Dalio. The things that were coming at me that I had to deal with often surprised me if they didn't happen in my lifetime, huh. but I found that they happened many times in history. Uh -huh. 
It's just that the cycle runs on a longer time frame than a single human lifetime. And of course, the human race is generally pretty rubbish in learning from history. He talks about all this in detail in his book, Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. A lot more detail than we can cover in a video like this. So let's talk about the cycle and what's happening. That cycle starts with the rise. Your country comes out of hard times and a few things come together that give it something of a turbo boost. You have low levels of indebtedness. Your country has relatively small gaps between people, wealth, values, political gaps. And that's key because you need a society that will start pulling together with common purpose. I know, sounds crazy unrealistic, right? It then gets a period of strong and capable leadership. I know, sounds crazy unrealistic, right? OK, I'm going to stop saying that, but you kind of get the point. Wouldn't it be nice? Strong leadership, and it begins to set high standards for education and infrastructure. It values enterprise and rewards people for merit and hard work. That all leads to the rise. And eventually the society outcompetes the rest and makes it to the pinnacle. Your currency becomes the global reserve currency, meaning you can borrow a lot more than others can because so many want to own it. Suddenly, everybody in the world is more or less playing by your rules. But as we've already noted, once you become rich, you lose that hunger. You expect to be paid well, pretty much whatever you do, and you begin to indulge with excesses. Your society builds up debt in order to finance all the spending that it wants to do. In the early days, that spending was in investment that produced a pretty good return. But increasingly, those returns go down. Sometimes you're just borrowing in order to fund current expenditure. What's more, big gaps start to open up in your society. Gaps in wealth. Gaps in terms of political ideology. This erodes the will in the society for people to pull together. Instead, they start pulling apart. Challenges to your global position emerge from up-and-coming countries who see their opportunity in your increasingly obvious weakness. Eventually, the debt gets so big and the wealth creation so much smaller, your central bank just starts printing more and more money to pay for it. That eventually means your currency is no longer rated so highly. And at some point, you will therefore lose that reserve currency status. Is this sounding a bit familiar? Dalio went through and tracked all these elements against the great powers in recent history. Here's the version for the Dutch Empire that we've just discussed. As a cycle, it's sort of summed up by the well-known quote from a novel by G. Michael Hopf, Those Who Remain. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. Are we seeing the signs that we would expect if Ray Dalio's analysis was correct? Well, let's take education as an example. The OECD runs the PISA test, P-I-S-A, which ranks schools based on tests taken by 15-year-olds on a number of key subjects. Have a look at this. Top ranking for reading. China, United States down at number 13, former Empire Britain just below them. Just a fluke? Well, not so much. Top ranking for maths, China, the US doesn't even make it into the top 20. What about science, America being the world's top innovator as it is? Science, top ranking, China. United States ranks in at 18th. The declining state of American education is something that is widely acknowledged and discussed. One report from the Council on Foreign Relations said that declines in American educational performance were jeopardising national security, as well as its ability to compete in the global marketplace. 
Now, of course, it doesn't happen overnight. The US still has some of the elite universities that are the envy of the world. But overall, across its entire population, its quality of education seems to be on the way down. China is going up, although at a cost. This article talks about the huge pressure being put on Chinese children and their parents to keep up. It's the sort of stress that people in an affluent country would not tolerate, which is sort of a point. Countries on the rise do well because their populations see poverty around them, or at least just behind them. They will commit and make sacrifices for the shared goal of moving the country forward, or at least the goal of ensuring that their children are better off than they were. Developed countries, particularly the world leaders, or even the recent world leaders, are insulted at the idea that they might do the same. I mean, literally, shortly before making this video, the chief economist of the Bank of England said that in the face of inflation, people needed to accept that they were poorer now. So somehow in the UK, someone needs to accept that they're worse off. The Bank of England's chief economist, Hugh Pill, telling a US podcast people in the UK should stop seeking pay increases, pushing prices higher and generating inflation. That went down badly. How dare he suggest that we might have to get used to being less well off than we believe that we've got a right to be. Again, it's rich people telling the poor people to shut up, isn't it, basically? And look, that's entirely understandable. Things look very different when you're raising yourself out of poverty than they do when you've achieved a relatively high income that you then expect the government to defend. Wherever you are in the cycle, all you have to do is what feels intuitively right and sensible at the time in order to make your way to the next stage of the cycle. What does this actually mean, though? I mean, I'm part of what was the previous world power, the British Empire, the glory days, if such you can describe them, are very long gone indeed. But, you know, life here seems pretty good, all things considering. I'm not aware of any part of my life that is disadvantaged by my country no longer being the great world power. So what's it about? I mean, surely, if there's a point of being the world power, it should be that your citizens are happier than everyone else's? Well, people have produced surveys about how happy and satisfied people feel in different countries around the world. Let's have a look and see how the world powers fare on that index. Not terrible, but nowhere near the top. The US, the current number one power, comes in at just 15. Is that because the US is declining, perhaps? Maybe. Well, let's have a look at China which as the emerging up-and-coming power should be surging with happiness and confidence. But it comes in significantly lower than the US right now at 64. If you look at who's at the top of a happiness index, you find countries that have zero apparent wish to climb to the top of the global power stakes. It seems to me that if you look at that cycle, that first part when you're building yourself out of poverty isn't about happiness. It's about purpose. People subsuming what makes them comfortable and happy in the short term to get better, to get more educated, to get more skilled, to be able to build for the future. When it happens, you get the raw materials that may no guarantee, but may turn into a great power. The part that kicks you into decline seems to be about exactly the pursuit of comfort, of happiness, if you will, alongside the loss of that sense of purpose. Except those Scandinavian countries achieved a high degree of happiness, and they don't seem to be declining because of it. So maybe that decline is about the pursuit of comfort and happiness matched with the excessive consumption that comes with having reached the top of a pile. I mean, all of this is speculation, but the others have found that they can be happy with simpler lifestyles, with less things. 
they haven't reached the point where they are so excessively wealthy that they can just take everything for granted. They cannot become complacent. But the more I look at it, the more I realise that is still missing the point. What does it really mean to be a world power? It means that to some degree, you get your values to set the framework for the world order that then everybody lives within. And that, more than anything else, is why the change that we're seeing now might actually turn out to be a pretty big deal. The values of the Dutch and the values of the emerging British Empire were not that far removed, which is hardly surprising really, because William of Orange was the King of England at the same time as being a Prince of the Netherlands. The values were very closely aligned. And so it was as well for the British Empire and the Americans. The values were very similar. They were allies during the war and indeed since. And those values were reflected in the world order as it came to be. For truth, justice and the American way. And let's not be naively idealistic about it. Of course, great powers have often broken their own rules, failed to live up to their own values. There's a whole other video, probably a stream of videos you could do looking at it. But the point is that for the first time in a number of cycles, the emerging new world order could actually be very different in terms of its values to what came before. Whatever you think about it, and China has an ancient and rich culture that has much to commend it, but China's current political values and priorities are very different to the US. It is an authoritarian country. It does not permit free speech and free expression. It does not celebrate free enterprise unless it serves the interests of the state. We don't need to go into the detail. We don't need to get all tribal and judgmental about it to recognize this would be a bigger shift than those we've seen in recent centuries. So China is definitely the next world power. Well, the signs are looking quite strong, but there are things going on that have never happened before in human history, which means that at least some of the script that we're writing is going to be new. Six things. One, China is a dictatorship. And it may well be that there are a number of factors in that style of leadership that may undermine its ability to become a world leader. Two, population. All of our previous empires built their wealth on a steadily growing population that was coming out of poverty. But China's population and increasing parts of the world's has stopped growing and started what is expected to be a medium term gradual decline. We don't know what that looks like. We know that it means more older people needing to be supported by fewer working age people. We don't know how big a difference that will make to an emerging world power nation, especially one like China, which is somewhat averse to the idea of mass immigration of low-skilled, low-cost workers coming into the country. Free. While China has many of Dalio's factors going for it, it has already built up significant amounts of debt. More than you would expect for this point in the cycle. A long way behind where America is, it may or may not turn out to be a factor. 4. While China is ambitious for its currency to replace the dollar with its own currency as the global reserve, it is a very long way from achieving that. 5. Never before has the world had to grapple with so many common problems. Things like climate change. However much America and China would like to retreat into their part of the world with their allies and their separate financial systems, they need to keep coming back together because we have common problems that can't be solved alone. And six, and sort of related, with AI technology in warfare, we have added to the number of technologies that we dare not unleash upon each other. Now, all of that being said, there is no doubt America is on the way down. It keeps raising its debt limit as though that's something that can continue forever. There are huge gaps between people in terms of wealth and values, and those gaps are well developed into deep political conflicts. Leadership seems relatively weak, regardless of which political party wins office. 
The outcome of all of that is those of us that have been used to a unipolar world designed around America's values, at the very least it seems like it's going to be a more unstable world, a bipolar world where conflict is much closer to the surface. So where does this leave us, if nothing else, with the understanding that power relationships still matter? If we think that fairness, rather than simply might equals right, is still something that we want to see strongly reflected in the world order that we all live within, then the question is, what are we going to do about that? I mean, seriously, do we still want this stuff? By which I mean, how hard are we willing to work for it? However stable we like to say our societies are, really, just under the surface, we rather suspect they're quite fragile. And we're scared of that fragility because we don't know if we as individuals anymore have the reserves to cope if we have to fall back on our own intuition. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should all run off and become preppers. But maybe we need to be thinking about how we make ourselves better and stronger in the expectation that we do still live in a changing world. Since we've established that there's a good chance that China will be the next world power, it makes sense to try to work out how they see the world, and particularly how Xi Jinping sees the world. I did a video deep dive on exactly that topic, and if you're interested, you might want to watch that video next.